Hello and welcome to Indus Special. I'm Michelle Malek. Almost a week following the bloody military crackdown, which reportedly killed more than 100 protesters and injured several hundred others, the civil disobedience called by the protesters continues in Sudan. The reports coming out of the country are harrowing with accounts of rape and attacks on healthcare worker workers. On tonight's show, we take a closer look at the events unfolding as the uprisings and the resistance continues in Sudan. Let's introduce our panel for this segment. Joining us from South Sudan is our correspondent, Oit Patrick. We're also joined by Mr. Khalil Charles, who are who's a political analyst, joining us from Istanbul. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, Patrick, let me begin with you. Now, it's the second day of the civil disobedience. Eleven people have been reportedly been killed. Give us a picture of what is happening on ground. Yes, uh, the situation in Sudan, of course, remains tense. The leaders of the protests have uh, called for a, for a civil strife. Many people are obeying this, of course, because uh, the level of violence that has occurred in uh, Khartoum in the past few days is a level that had never been seen even uh, when this uh, uh, demonstration started in uh, December last year. Uh, even during the time of uh, former President Omar al-Bashir, this level of, uh, of violence had not been made on the civil uh, population. So people are, st are staying home, the streets are empty. The, 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 what we had seen in the past months where people used to sit uh, down and, you know, uh, uh, show their, you know, their whatever they want, that is for the military to, to go and form uh, for for the uh, civilian government to be formed. We don't see anymore. The streets are empty. The city is more or less like a ghost city now. now people are feeling fearing to come out because there have been killings, as you have as rightly mentioned. Uh, people have been killed, uh, people are scared, some are injured, some hospitals have been surrounded, some medical staff have been also threatened. So all this is playing into uh, perhaps what the military wanted to achieve, that is to scare off the protesters, and therefore they would become stronger in the, in the negotiations, if at all uh, negotiations will ever take place, because the protesters are saying, they right. are pulling out of the talks as well. We have seen uh, the... Right. So uh, you mentioned here that the uh, 11 people that have been killed, uh, that is uh, confirmed. Now, uh, we are seeing that with the civil disobedience beginning just on Sunday, 11 people already have been killed. And you also mentioned that the streets are empty. Who are these 11 people? Do we know more about them? Not really, not really, because these are these are uh, basically civilians with the with of uh, you know the show of force being done by the military and, and uh, surrounding even people are afraid. Even journalists now, when you are reporting, you report in in hiding. It is not uh, like before when uh, you know President Omar al Bashir was removed from power. Journalists were out; they were reporting openly and so on. All these things are now. Uh, kind of restricted. Everybody is fearing even to come out and try to trace what is going on. Even now, what most journalists are doing is that they are using their phones to film. Uh, when the protest began in December, people were doing the same thing because of fear of the regime. They were using phones majorly to film and all that. Uh, but then President Omar of the government, come, journalists are coming up with cameras, their audio recorders and so forth to, 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 to do work openly. But again, we are seeing a situation where it is difficult. And yeah, so yes, the civilians have been killed. Uh, the numbers are there. But who exactly to say it is so and so and so and so, these details are not yet uh, out for the public. Right. And we've been hearing about how there is a lack of internet access because that has been blocked. Uh, what is that uh, situation like? A communication uh, uh, through the internet and the telephone lines? What is happening on that front? Yeah, yeah, it is very difficult. It is very difficult now to actually talk to people. You know, whenever uh, most of these, uh, you know, dictatorial regimes, when uh, when they want to make some kind of violence on the people and so on, the first thing they try to block is the communication. And we've seen this also happening. Uh, our colleagues who are there in Khartoum, uh, to get to them has become difficult. We used to connect to them on WhatsApp and all these things. Now you try it, uh, somebody's offline. Uh, they, 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 but generally, in Khartoum, also the, the SIM cards, the, 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 the mobile networks have also been having some issues. But now we see even it is even more difficult to, to communicate. So perhaps this is one way to ensure that 
uh, not so much information gets out of, of Khartoum as, you know, there is an uh, international call uh, to... To the, to the army to, you know, to, to leave power to the civilian, and there has been condemnation of the violence going on. So they will try as much as possible to ensure that not much information goes out. So that one, yes, is there. Right. And just in these past two days, we've been hearing more and more about the attacks that are being carried out. There were uh, uh, reports on social media that stated that in hospitals, healthcare workers were not only attacked, but they were also raped. There was also a social media post which showed that the University of Khartoum had been uh, destroyed or some parts of it had been destroyed. Is there a confirmation on any of these reports coming out? Uh, Really much of confirmation, because the confirmation you would want to hear from uh, the government officials, from the authorities, and the authorities are very selective in what they are saying. Uh, they are saying very little and, uh, you know, no room for questioning what is going on on and things like that. So, yes, these things are being reported, but to get a confirmation from the official is a little bit difficult, given the fact that this is a military, a military uh, these are a right. group of people who don't talk uh, like a normal civilian government where you are, yeah, so... Of course. Uh, that is but, the situation. Right. Uh, but Patrick, falling from that, what are the journalists talking about, especially after the crackdown and now that more information is coming about how bloody that crackdown was, in fact? Uh, how much do we know about the casualties, about the destruction, especially from uh, journalists working on ground and from activists uh, on ground? What uh, has been the real um, information that can be extracted from that situation? I think it's very clear because uh, the government has said that uh, the number of people killed is above, uh, above 60. They put the number to about 62 to 64. Whereas uh, the civil societies, the protesters, they're saying the number is actually more than 100. And we've heard from various uh, civil uh, organizations, human rights organizations, saying more than 100 people were actually have been killed and they are saying that some people were you know some bodies were thrown in, in the river nile and uh, you know a lot of uh, atrocities have been committed actually so the number is high and perhaps because of the confusion people are still unable to you know to try to verify where their relatives are when all comes down the number could even be more than what people are talking about now right and uh, it seems that the uh, Transitional Military Council actually now does want to talk to the protesters after international uh, pressure being put on them. Is that something that the protesters uh, want to do or have they lost complete faith and trust in the Transitional Military Council? The protesters are saying they do not want now to talk to the military council. They are saying that they want the military to go to the barracks and uh, let the civilian form a government. Now, uh, this is also a, a situation that we have talked to some analysts and they are saying uh, the demand of the protesters is also somehow unrealistic because even when they protested and President Omar al-Bashir became weaker and weaker, the people who actually hosted Bashir is the military. So to totally uh, push them away and say, go home or go to the barracks and let us run the government is also very unrealistic because they also have a stake in this government. And after all, no government can actually run as purely civilian without the support of the military. You also need their support in as much as you want them to leave uh, the, 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 the running of the government to civilians. And not only that also, if you want to come to power as a civilian, the best way to do is, 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 to, is to go through a democratic process to be able to come. So if this is a transition whereby you have only three years or whatever uh, amount of uh, period of time you give yourself, then there is no need for you to say the military totally should be out of the government. Right. So that is how uh, some people are looking at it. They're saying the protesters are pushing the military to a corner whereby the military are now trying to use, uh, you know, force. Right. Yeah. And thank you so much, uh, Mr. Oit Patrick, for joining us and giving us both sides of what has happened ground. Uh, that was our correspondent joining us from South Sudan. Uh, Mr. Khalil Charles, uh, I'll move to you. Following from what uh, Mr. Patrick was talking about, that the demand of the protesters for the military uh, to, uh, to withhold the power completely is unrealistic. Do you see that uh, in the same light? 
I think it's true to say that the, the military at the beginning of all of this were part of the revolution. They're the ones in essentially that uh, got rid of Umar Bashir. But I think after the events of last Monday and the killing of uh, now we know uh, roughly 120 uh, protesters and the figures are going up, I think after that action, uh, people have lost faith and confidence in uh, a, a, an organization which said, was said it's it's for people, but it actually is killing people. So it, it may seem unrealistic, but really I think the pressure is so great now that the military really don't have a, a place to turn. And I think uh, they were hoping that uh, Abi, Abi Ahmed of the of the Ethiopia, the prime minister, might be able to do some kind of resolution for them with respect to uh, finding a mediation uh, that, they, that the two sides could agree. But uh, as far as we understand, he did try uh, to say to, to, to the military, you can have six or seven on the council, let it be a, a majority of the civilians, and then rotate the presidency. And this also was rejected. So I think there's a different fear now amongst the military that not only are the civilians likely to, um, uh, to bring charges against the people who were part of the government. But it's quite clear now that after the events of last Monday, that the civilian government will be interested in, in bringing charges and bringing accountability to the people who were behind the massacre of the people last Monday. Right. Uh, and it's uh, uh, the Transitional Military Council has also scraped the agreement that it did uh, reach with the main uh, opposition, which was that elections would be held after three years. They're now saying that snap elections will be held after nine months. What are the implications of that? Well, the implications are there are uh, millions, I should say, of people who are disenfranchised, who are not able to put, cast their vote. You have to remember, in Sudan, there are three warring areas going on, in Darfur, in Blue Nile, and in South Kordofan. And those, there are displaced people living in camps who are not registered as citizens. These people have a right to be part of the, uh, the, the, the poll. And to say that uh, a, an event like a major election can take place within nine months would be essentially to, be, to disenfranchise a large section of the, of the population who, who may or may not uh, uh, want to cast their vote. So that's one of the main problems that they're facing, the implications of this nine months. The second implication I think one has to consider is that the old structures of running the election, which was, which was dominated by President Bashir and uh, his uh, uh, team, are still in place. And so there needs to be a sweep, sweeping change to the way in which elections are done. Uh, people have to be reorganized. You know, there's the, the, the way in which the, the, the council is done has to be has to be set up all these procedures have to be set up and thirdly the implication is it won't allow people enough time to actually discuss the issues that affect them and so anybody who comes along now will probably be voting on, on previous party lines or previous religious lines because some of the parties are based on religious sufi orders and so it just may, may, means you're going back to the same situation where the public are not informed about the issues that affect them so having a, a, a speedy election uh, won't actually bring bring a resolution to the problems that the people face in Sudan. Right. Uh, but given that the uh, main protesters who have called for the civil disobedience have also claimed that they will only end the civil disobedience when a civilian government announces that it's in power on national television. Now, given that there is a, uh, an evident power struggle there, does it seem like it's a complete deadlock uh, currently? And do you see anything uh, budging from either side? Well, my analysis is that I feel that it's only a matter of time. Um, one can have a lot of despair, uh, but what the military did last Monday has actually brought together some of the forces who weren't even supporting the protest movements or the protest leaders. You have your Islamic parties uh, like the Muslim Brotherhood, you have like the um, uh, Popular National Congress. These are all Islamic-based uh, parties who have come out openly and condemned them for their action. And so it's un very unlikely that the military has any uh, port where it, can, where it can put its ship, where it can dock, where it can find solace. It doesn't have that at the moment. And so with the pressure coming from the outside world, with the UN, with the EU, with the African Union, all against them, and, and might have to and, push, and, to push uh, the uh, And Mr. Council. Charles, hold on to that thought. I want to introduce another guest uh, that has joined us, fact, Dr. Sara Abdul Ghali, who is joining us from Norwich, UK. She is the president of Sudan Doctors' Union. We're also joined by Ms. Yusra Abdul Munim, uh, who is a student activist joining us from London. Thank you both for joining us, Dr. Sara. Let me begin with you. Now, going back to the violence we were talking about after the crackdown on uh, June the 3rd, uh, we heard 
about bodies being dumped in the River Nile because they wanted to uh, hide the number of people that were killed. What more do we know about the rapes that took place, the violence that took place, and how much violence was in fact uh, inflicted upon the people and the protesters? Um, thank you for your interest in Sudan. Um, the violence has uh, been uh, ongoing, uh, but not in um, the, the, you know, the same sort of scale as the 3rd of June. So on the 13th of May, there was another massacre, another trial uh, to try to remove uh, the peaceful uh, protests from the city. Then on the 3rd of uh, June, uh, there was the massacre, and we are, you know, uh, the, the information from Sudan that 100 plus lost their lives. It's very important to as well state that while they were shooting peaceful protesters, they were as well blocking any medical aid uh, for those who were injured. They surrounded the medical clinics to prevent emergency care. Some were burned inside these clinics. Uh, there were rape cases, um, which we know, which confirmed this fall. Some of them are even working in the uh, health professionals. Uh, a few uh, bodies have been uh, removed from the River Nile. And um, the first uh, sort of post-mortem, I wouldn't call it post-mortem, but what the doctors have mentioned that these cases were um, uh, sadly shot. And then um, there were stones tied to the bodies so they will sink, and nobody will recover them. There are 100 or 120 missing activists. We don't know whether they are safe because of the Internet uh, blockage. We don't know whether they are detained. We don't know whether they are killed. But even worse, they followed the um, injured into the hospitals. They invaded the hospital at the beginning of uh, last week, uh, threatening the doctors, the nurses, and the patients themselves. Uh, what is happening at the moment is a, uh, yani a complete, um, I would say, invasion and uh, repetition to what happened in Darfur and other parts by the RSF, the Janjaweed. And it's to threaten and frighten the people of Sudan who have led a peaceful, civilized, not violent resistance for the last uh, five months. Right. And uh, uh, Ms. Yusra, uh, going to you, uh we're talking about all these reports coming out and activists is dedicated to this cause. Knowing more about this cause, who is non-Sudanese, would also be glued uh, to the Internet trying to hear about the updates that are coming. Uh, what uh, reports did you hear about coming out of, after the crackdown, especially on places such as Twitter, Facebook, where this revolution has gained a lot of momentum over the past five months? Um, Lemini um, Association to try to collect, gather the information and verify them and try to shed the light for uh, shed the light on the ongoing atrocities in Sudan to the international media. We use Twitter. Uh, we also try to transfer information to people inside Khartoum or inside Sudan uh, through SMS and through one of the applications, FireChat. Right. And uh, gaining from all the uh, information that you have gathered, how much displacement was there on ground? How much confusion? How much chaos was there, in fact, after the crackdown? And that still continues uh, today. Um, so far, we've received a lot of information. Um, and so far, we're actually a bit scared because even though most of the majority of the population have no access to the Internet, yet we're seeing all these atrocities. So um, everyone is anticipating what might emerge if the, if the Internet went back to the country. Um, right. So, yeah. Right. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, Mr. Y uh, Ms. Yusra, for joining us and talking to us about this. Mr. Yusra, going back to you and talking about who is responsible for this violence, the Rapid Support Forces. Now, in a 2015 report, the Human Rights Watch described the RSF as men with no mercy. Seeing what has happened recently and what is continuing to happen, is that uh, a statement you would agree with? 
Well, I would certainly agree that uh, they uh, have been very ruthless in the way they've dealt with people in, in Khartoum. Of course, you have to understand there was a civil war going on at that time, time and uh, atrocities do happen and take care in civil war. However, this is not a civil war. This is peaceful protesters, peaceful uh, demonstrators who are asking for their rights as civilians and citizens. And so, therefore, the heavy-handed tactics of the RSF uh, are certainly very, very, very uh, weak ones. can criticize that very, very strongly. But the leader of the RSF, uh, he is uh, putting himself out as, as a man of the people. Uh, I understand that uh, Hamidti, as he's called, uh, Mohammed Hamdan, he actually paid $100 towards the salaries of teachers and said that he would increase the salaries of teachers. Uh, and he actually paid into the Bank uh, of Sudan. He has uh, put himself up as, uh, as you know, as the savior of the, of, of the people. But in fact, he is the one that's, that's prepared and is going to be continuing to be prepared to take uh, uh, draconian uh, and brutal action uh, when that's necessary. But I understand that there continues to be disputes within the security forces. Uh, the army and the, the rapid security forces uh, are, are now seeing eye to eye, but they never have done because the, uh, the RSF was started by uh, President Bashir as a separate unit with a separate financing. The, what they've done is they've separated uh, the the, the, the the city. Uh, they've given the RSF the center of Khartoum. On demand in the north, they've given to the army. And then the Bahri is being looked after by the, by the police and the security forces. So this is part of uh, an operation to separate the, the differences that are, that are arising between the, between the security forces and the army. Right. Uh, and uh, Dr. Sara, talking about the army and the security forces that have a uh conducted all this violence has uh, have oppressed the people's voices uh, tell us about uh, the conditions that were ongoing for the past couple of days we were hearing about home raids where people were hiding behind under their beds uh, in order to avoid being uh, suspected by the uh, armed forces for being in their homes there is a palpable sense of fear in the environment what more can you tell us about the people's willpower to continue this resistance? So, so I think um, there, there is obviously fear and uh, the Janjaweed or the rapid uh, support team are a, actually a terrorist group, um, although they are not formally um, you know, being named. Uh, uh, the, the main you know, stories that we hear um, are very worrying. For example, those who have uh, kidney dialysis and they need to go for the dialysis, uh, they, uh, on the street, they have been stopped and they have been asked and they have been threatened. Um, people who need the medication, if they have insulin or medication for uh, epilepsy, trying to go to the pharmacies, they feel threatened, but they have to go. Otherwise, uh, they will be unwell. Uh, I'm aware of stories of people who want to try to go and get some bread or yogurt, even from a small shop, and they will ask to go back uh, inside their houses. Um, there is no indication for what's happening. Uh, there were peaceful uh, protesters in a sitting in front of the headquarters. The question is, why is the spread of this ginger wheat in uh, not only Khartoum, but other cities in Sudan? What is the indication? There is no indication apart from that the, the Transitional Military Council is trying to threaten the people of Sudan to uh, crack down the uh, peaceful resistance. And uh, this should not be accepted. The main concern is the support of the TNC by money from some countries in the Middle East, by swords and intelligence from Egypt, for example. And that's a repetition to what has been happening. And therefore, the international community and the policymakers should be aware and have to right. paralyze the Transitional Military Council. Right. And you make a very uh, strong point there, Dr. Sadra abdul Ghali. Thank you so much for joining us. Now we're also joined by another guest, Mr. Mokaram uh, Mifta, who's an analyst joining us from Ankara. Thank you so much, Mr. Mifta, for joining us. Now, we know that there were popular uprisings in Sudan in 1964 and in 1985. What do you think makes this uprising, this revolution, different from all the others that uh, came before it? And do you think there will be a different outcome Outcome after this one. Current political deadlock in Khartoum, Khartoum uh, remains to be economic uh, reasons. Unemployment is a serious cause of concern at this particular point in time. About 20% of 
Sudanese are unemployed, educated is unemployment is a serious cause of cancer, and there has been a growing uh, uh, concern about human rights issues in, in Sudan. So that makes it somehow distinct from the, 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 the core history in, in the political history of modern Sudan. Well, when it comes to the, 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 how it's going to be in the coming days and, and, and months, I think there are important political actors who need to be involved in this political, in, in the current political uh, deadlock in, in Sudan. I think apart from the Sudanese Professional Association and the Force for Freedom and Change uh, and the Military Council, I think Egypt the activity engaged uh, uh, apart from being bystanders in this peaceful, uh, in this uh, attempt to build uh, more platable, more, more, more meaningful uh, transition in, in, in Sudan. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, we're also joined by Ms. Sara uh, Hamid, who is representative of the Sudanese abroad students and alumni. She's joining us from uh, Sudan right now. Uh, Ms. Sara, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us about how important the youth and the younger demographic has been throughout this revolution. We just heard our earlier analysts talking about how unemployment has been at a very uh, at an all-time high. We know that the demographic, 63% of it is of, made up of young people. So what role have they been playing in this revolution so far? Um, the, the young youth have been showing tremendous unity and solidarity towards this revolution. The youth actually are the ones that started and leading revolution, the revolution right now. So they play such a big role in it. And even like even the elder people in Sudan give them all the credit because how much... Um, commitment and resilience that they've shown throughout this whole revolution because they suffered the most uh, in regards to finding work or good education or just basic necessities in life, basically. Right. And were there uh, concerns primarily related to the economy uh, or were, was there something more to it when they came out in so many, in such a large amount uh, and came out onto the streets and protested almost every day for the past five months? Yeah, the main reason they came out is due to, to the economy. The economy has become... Um, severely bad in Sudan. Inflation has become crazy. Prices have become um, off the roof. People couldn't afford even to buy bread at some point. So this was one of the main reasons why uh, the youth decided to walk out and actually fight for their rights. But also because we've been oppressed by this government for 30 years. There's no women's rights. Um, there's no human rights in general. Um, so the people just decided to Stop, stop um, just dealing with it and actually go out and protest for the rights. Right. Uh, and Mr. Charles, going back to you, we're seeing more and uh, more developments coming about and we're all talking about how to break this deadlock, there needs to be an international uh, influence coming from outside of Sudan. Do you think at this present moment there is ample amount of uh, uh, pressure coming on to the Transitional Military Council? I think if these protests continue and people do continue not to go to work and support the civil disobedience, then the pressure on the military council is going to be such that the outside world is, is going to have to look again at how they support it, particularly the, um, Egypt as well. Now, there are already splits within the African Union as to how to deal with this, this, this situation. But it's quite clear to me that the, the resilience and the determination that's within the country. I was there. I left uh, Sudan or was reporting in Sudan until the, until the 2nd of uh, uh, June, uh, uh, the day before the, 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 the massacre. And uh, what I saw in that area, uh, uh, where, where which was later uh, later attacked, uh, are groups of people who were working together in complete solidarity. Uh, people from different parts of the country, from Darfur, from the east, uh, from the west, uh, and they were all working together. There were arts workshops. There were people of religious uh, uh, denomination. They played prayed prayers there. It was a, a, a wonderful uh, atmosphere, and they were all clubbed together in a determination to get civilian rule. And I don't think it's going to go away. I don't think people are going to get tired of asking for that. Then they're, they're there for the long rule. In terms of the army, I do feel the pressure 
is increasing and will continue to increase on them. And they would want to have some kind of mediation, uh, somebody who will step up and give them some guarantees that they, in the end, won't be prosecuted for what they've done. Uh, not, never mind what uh, uh, Omar Bashir did previously to that, of which uh, he also has to stand trial for his misgivings but or misdealings. But the army now of the situation where they also have to stand, uh, uh, you know, to have to be made accountable for what they've done. So it's it's a matter of time. It's, it's hard to say how long that's going to be. But it's certainly not going to be very long, right. uh, in, in my estimation. Right. I, I think, you know, within within right. months or, and, or less. And, and Mr. Perhaps. Charles, we're running out of time segment, but thank you so much for your input there. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, that was Khalil Charles joining us from Istanbul. Uh, Ms. Sara Ahmed, just a last question to you. Now, we're talking about unity here. We're talking about all the conditions that were prevalent prior to the crackdown. Now, after the crackdown, we're hearing about there being a very strong sense of fear amongst the people. Do you think that the will and the resistance to continue the struggle still remains there in place? Um, yes, um, as the other speaker, speaker mentioned, I've been to the to the sit-in as well last month, and it, there has been there. I've never seen my country like I've seen it like that before ever in my life, and I feel like if they continue being as resilient and as united, we can actually make it. We're, we're trying our best right now to get the international community's attention. Uh, we've heard that the UN Security Council has um, condemned the issue in Sudan, uh, but apparently it was vetoed. So right now we've been hearing that the EU is trying to negotiate some talks. So we have our hope and faith in that right now at the moment. Right. And on that note, thank you so much, Ms. Sarah Hamid, for joining us and taking the time to talk to us. We're going to take a short break. When we return, we're going to discuss this story further. Stay with us. Welcome back to Indus Special. One of the things that has stood out during the uprisings in Sudan is the number of women who have come out to protest. These women have been at the forefront chanting slogans and, and stirring the masses. We explore the history of women's political participation in Sudan and what it means at this point in time. Joining us for this discussion today is Ms. Razan Ahmed, who is an activist joining from Dubai. We're also continuing with Mr. Mukarram Mifta, who is an analyst joining us from Ankara. Mr. Mifta, let me begin with you. Let's touch upon the political history a little bit and how women throughout Sudan's history have been involved in political uprisings and the role they have played throughout them. Uh, women are playing an important role, essentially. So they are the one who are uh, leading the, the protests in many, in many places and, and in fact, some of them are university educated. Uh, and it seems to me that even the uh, Sudanese Professional Association who are actually currently spearheading protests, they have promised to give priority to issues of women that concerns women. And I think that's going to be uh, one of you know the things that makes it somehow unique in so far as the political history of Sudan is concerned. Uh, when from that particular vantage point, uh, it seems that uh, unless the current crackdown on the popular appraisal and protest continues, I think women will be more proactive uh, in their uh, disobediency protests against the uh, current TNC, the current Transitional Military Council. Right. Yeah. Uh and um, Ms. Razan, uh, continuing from that onwards, how important was it for women to come out in this uh, much strength and with so much power, especially after al-Bashir's rule ended, given in mind the rules and laws he put in place regarding women in Sudan? Mm -hmm. um, women in Sudan have very naturally... Um, upholded their leadership position. Um, it's, it's ancient, actually, amongst us. Uh, the world's first queens who won wars as wives um, were Sudanese, and they are called, otherwise known as the Kandaka. So whether or not uh, Bashir's impositions um, upon women and, and limiting our ability to our very natural ability to thrive and to lead and to prosper, um, despite what he attempted to do, uh, Sudanese women have have never really faltered from that natural 
uh, power. And, you know, Lafayette University, for example, which is an all women's university, continued um, education is still a priority. Yes, there have been some limitations um, due to his oppressive rule, um, but uh, it, it didn't necessarily hinder. Upon his departure, women took their original role, their original position. But what has disgusted me, quite frankly, is that despite the women's role in organization, in mobilization, in protesting, in, in literally putting themselves in the front line throughout this revolution, we still are yet to have any kind of position in the decision-making process. During these failed negotiations, not once did I see a presence, a, a decent presence of women um, represented on either side. And, and despite you know, it, it, this is obviously a debatable opinion, but I do feel that perhaps we, th these negotiations may have gone somewhere if the woman's role was considered in the decision making and negotiating process. Um, and that that has been my ultimate disappointment. Um, and, and, it, and it is what I continue to advocate for. Right. Uh, and Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Following from that very strong point that Ms. Razan made here, that women were at the forefront of the revolution, they were standing on the front lines, but when it came to the formal political process, they were marginalized, and had they been included, the outcome might have been different. Do you agree with that point of view? What is your take on that? Well, the condition in Sudan, insofar as women's political participation is concerned, is no is different from other countries in Horn of Africa in particular. I mean, we are currently undergoing the same transitional process in Ethiopia as well, a country which is now located the, the, almost south of Sudan, now currently is undergoing a transition. It, it appears that, that, the, that the transition is more of probably more peaceful, uh, more successful, as opposed to the one that we are experiencing in Sudan. But again, Dr. Abiy Ahmed, who is now currently the, the leading the transition in Ethiopia, seems to have uh, embraced the idea you know, of the, the, the genuine you know, engagement of participation of women in its parliament. And however, there are a number of critics who have criticized his move, uh, pointing out that women should have been you know, part and parcel of the political process before the transition, not necessarily in the transition period. So the transition, the current uh, uh, political actors in Sudan, likewise, the, I mean, the Sudan's professional association, whose almost half of, of its members are women, essentially, uh, may probably in the coming days and, 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 and months may help pave the way for women to come out and lead politics in general and have their own say in politics in general. But generally speaking, in Africa in general, right. in many parts of the world, in right. developed countries, right. it is less likely that you see women to play an active role. Right. And thank you, uh, Mr. Miftah, for joining us and giving us your input and insight in very important discussion. We're now joined by Ms. Nadia Noor, who's an activist joining us from Sudan. Welcome to the show, Ms. Noor. Now, talking about the role that women have played throughout this revolution, statistics that media organizations are reporting is that 70 percent of the protesters so far had been women. What was pushing women to come out in such an overwhelming majority? And was this unprecedented? No, actually, um, throughout Sudan history, women have played a central role in society and political life. So um, we can say at uh, the ancient Nubian kingdom, women were queens and queen mothers, and they were referred as kandakat, or strong women. In the four region and Western Sudan, more broadly, women who write poems, you know, and who lead all uh, virtues and traits, such as bravery in times of war, and um, and you know the genocide which uh, the the government of Al Bashir done in the four women, they played a very um, significant social political role. Right. So, so following from a point, uh, Ms. Noor, following from an earlier point made by Ms. Razan, that she stated very strongly that women were not included at all during the negotiation period after the uprisings with the Transitional Military Council. Why do you think that was the case? Why do you think women were marginalized or their voices were not even included during the political process there? That was, that was, that was, you know, that was not at all 
actually um, um, a good positive thing of what the women have actually participated in this revolution. And um, because of the military council uh, men, I would say that they were not um, accepting women to come into the negotiations because they are, they are not actually valuing and, and, and appreciating what women ha have already done in this revolution. And because of the oppression and uh, uh, the, the way they've treated women over the last 30 years, and uh, you know the, the the public or the law. They were women are were like they have been arrested, detained, beaten, imprisoned for only what they wearing. If they're having like a trousers or right. anything, right? Uh, so 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 women are really um, being under a lot of um, very. But they they, but they, 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 they the women are uh, uh, were not treated right. Right. And Ms. Noor, hold on to that thought. I want to ask Ms. Razan here, uh, given to uh, given regarding what Ms. Noor has about, and we do hear about Sudan's Public Order Act, which allowed for women to be treated this way, uh, for not be, uh, being able to wear trousers or not being able to stand in public with someone who is not a male relative. The systematic discrimination and oppression against women, do you think that will take much longer to change than even after uh, the this revolution, let's hope, succeeds? Uh, that's a very interesting question, question because, you know, um, it's interesting, obviously, how, how our uh, imposition can, can be cultured and, and become part and parcel of, of a way of life as opposed to a, a rule in life. Um, so, yes, I, I do feel that in some spaces within Sudanese society, it may take some time um, for for women to return fully into that position of of, of liberation and and um, uh, and freedom, really to to really practice, thrive, and 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 be who we truly are or who we want to be. But ultimately, and and this is looking at the arts and culture revival that has taken place throughout this revolution. I mean, with, with every tragedy, I like to believe that, that there is some beauty and, and what has come out of the revolution um, and has really brought me personal joy as, as, um, as someone who believes in culture as a tool for expression and a tool for, for society build is that the arts and culture revolution has shown us that women are able to express themselves. They're, they're, they are um, now uh, more in a position to, to, to truly artistically um, uh, reign uh, right. and, and uh, bestow their, 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 who they are and what they believe in terms of moving forward. So because of this revival, because of this arts and culture revival and the role women have played there, I do believe that it, would be an, it will be a very smooth return to, to who we once were. Right. And you talk about uh, uh, the key takeaway from me, and that is the smooth return back to what uh, existed, the positions that existed for women before. Uh, Ms. Nadia Noor, talking a little more about the on-ground realities. Now, most of the military uh, personnel are men here. And with the violence that has been systematically uh, being inflicted upon the civilians, we do know that violence against women has a very different kind of nature. Now, what has been the spe specific uh, implications of that on women? What type of violence have they had to face over the past five months, and especially after the crackdown? Right. You know, uh, one of the one of the re reasons, the women have been suffering, as I mentioned to you earlier, from a really very bad load, uh, starting from how they're dressed, uh, going to their work, their roles in society, um, uh, education-wise. But economic hardship may have further driven women to play a leading role in this protest because they shoulder most of the burden in maintaining the day-to-day -day finances. So um, they know that the economy is flattering under the weight of corruption and, um, you know, uh, misusing of the resources that Sudan is a very rich country. So um, whether it's staying at home 
to care for their children or working to contribute financial support to their families. Women feel, daily feel more than when how life is becoming difficult for them. I mean, um, we can say historically in the last 30 years they have suffered a lot. But this revolution, one of the reasons this, re this revolution uprising is actually happened in um, December 2018 because of the economic hardship which women feel the most um, in the society. Right. They're mothers, they're working ladies, they're, 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 you know, they're actually the, the, what, the, the base uh, line of, of, right. of the family. And, and Ms. Noor, yeah. since we're running uh, short on time, I just want to put a last uh, quick question to you. Given that the events that have unfolded in the past couple of days, what are the sentiments of women and the Sudanese people at large at this point in time? The country is devastated. We have so, so many young youth, um, uh, you know, uh, generations. They actually, they killed them. The country is absolutely devastated at this time. And um, we are hoping that the international community and, um, yeah, and, and we are now, uh, there is civil disobedience happening in Sudan, that, that these two um, peace factors of fighting this military council is going to put a pressure on on them to hand over the the the, the power to civilians. And right. that 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 but, but 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 talking about Sudan, it's very very painful because the country is going through a very difficult time, and it's very uh, very essential for us to keep. Um, ourselves in the safe side of not getting into any uh, civil wars. So right. um, we, we're just using two main key factors at this moment, civil disobedience, hoping that the international organizations and, you know, the international community to have pressure on this military council for this, uh, what they're doing now. And with all the devastation that has been struck, is there optimism that there will be light at the end of the tunnel after uh, all of this settles down? The, the, uh, I, I, I am very much optimistic that this is not going to last really long. Right. It can't. By all measures of humanitarian, um, you know, uh, facts, I don't think this is going to, to, to last long. It will end soon. Right. And on that yeah. note, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Yanur, for joining us and talking to us. And thank you so much, Ms. Razan Ahmed, for taking out the time and talking to us. With that, thank you so much for watching In The Special. We will see you again tomorrow with more stories. Till then, goodbye and take care.